Ta-da, there it is. Good morning. I, I tell my students that I am sort of their uh, parents' worst nightmare. I'm a, a university professor uh, at a state university, so that means I'm a bureaucrat. I also have just spent 10 years in city government as a member of our city council and then as mayor, so I'm a politician. And you put that combination together and you might end up with some uh, pretty bad outcomes. So you may want to filter the things that I'm saying to you uh, as, as I warn my students to you know, get out their filters and see what, it, what this bureaucratic politician is, is about to say. Uh, The standard approach in economics to dealing with problems is to say, well, let's either regulate or tax. And when, they, and when we see, say problems, what normally is meant is externalities. An, external, an externality is, a, a negative externality is a cost that I impose on you without you uh, having contracted to receive that cost. So I get the benefit of my action, you suffer the cost of my action. That's, that's a standard definition. Now, a, a positive externality, on the other hand, is where I get benefits from my action, but I'm also creating benefits that the rest of you enjoy. I was walking across our campus quad once with my, uh, a, a female teaching assistant, and there were some guys playing uh, volleyball on the quad, and uh, they were, it's sort of like the Top Gun scene. All of them have their, they're in shorts, they have their shirts off, and she said, now those are positive externalities. <laughs> uh, and one thing that we need to remember is that, pos that externalities run multiple directions and, and try and figure out what that, what that actually means. But the standard approach to say, oh no, externality, it's very much like the, um, when I was a teenager, there was a movie called The Russians Are Coming, and there's a line, people running down the street, uh, the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming, everyone to get from street. Well, that's how generally climate change is approached in terms of saying there's an externality, an externality, we've got to fix it, we have to do something. And that is gen has generally been the approach uh, about externalities. And then along comes this guy named Ronald Coase. And Coase was at the University of Chicago, and there was a group of economists who would get together for these, I think, were monthly dinners and sit around and chat about great things. And uh, so Ronald Coase shows up one evening with this idea. And the idea is that uh, externalities are very different from how anyone had thought about them. He said, first of all, the, uh, just because there's an, uh, an externality doesn't mean we're getting an, an inefficient outcome. It may be as good an outcome as we could get. And he had a lot of experience with that as he was editing the Journal of Law and Economics because he said, we always got these papers saying, Here's an externality and here's how to fix it, or, or as an analysis of how governments had tried to fix it. He said in almost every case they made things worse. And I actually have a, a book called Beyond Politics, but the working title of it used to be On Making Things Worse, Government Response to Market Failures. Uh, and I mean, that was strictly taken out of coast. It, there, if we look at how many supposed problems and supposed externalities there are and look at the proposed fixes, those fixes often cost more than what we had to start with. So just because there's inefficiency doesn't mean that we're going to actually improve it. The second is that the problem isn't that there are externalities, that my actions create costs, is that we don't have a way to negotiate about them. And one of the examples that Dan showed was about water in a stream. And it used to be that there were not clear enough property rights for people to be able to negotiate with each other. In the Western United States, in most states now, that's relatively fixed in that uh, well, it used to be under Western water law that the only way you could own water is if you diverted it from the stream. 
You couldn't leave water in the stream, which is called an in-stream flow. And legislatures have changed those laws, so now private groups have organized and purchase or trade or lease water from farmers to keep in the stream during the driest part of the year so that the fish actually have something to drink. Uh, and it's as soon as there was a, you could create, a, that ride that didn't exist, now exists, allowed for a lot, a whole bunch of negotiation. And it's just amazing seeing all of these water markets that have emerged in the West uh, around uh, environmental issues. I, I was, I just was at one a couple years ago where a point of diversion was moved 12 miles downstream. Because in the, in the, in the spring, the uh, farmers would run a, a cat up the, a caterpillar, up the bottom of the stream, push up a gravel dam and divert the entire stream into an irrigation ditch. And they had the right to do it, but uh, private groups came to them and worked out a deal where they move the point of diversion 12 miles downstream. So instead of having 12 miles of uh, no water, we're now far enough downstream that other streams have come in. And so that when they do divert their share of the water, there's still enough water for the fish. And it's, a, it's a really a great thing. But it's happened because of private negotiations, because it was clear that there were property rights. And when you have property rights, you can you can solve transaction cost problems. So maybe the thing that governments ought to be doing is figuring out how to uh, allow property rights rather than to mandate regulation. And the third thing uh, that Coase said, and this was just shocked the economists at the University of Chicago. Uh, by the way, they, he was of the 12 people, economists there None of them believed him at the first. At the end of the conversation, they all believed him. You know, to get an economist to change his mind. Uh, I mean, sorry. You know, the definition of economist is somebody who's really good with numbers but doesn't quite have enough personality to be an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, getting those people to actually change their mind is a pretty cool thing. Um, he said, there's little reason to assume that taxes or regulation will lead to efficient or even better results, and that's because of politics. And that leads us to a, a, a blend of economics and politics that is known by those of us who are insiders as public choice analysis. Economics is the study of private choices, Political, public choice is a study of public choices, how choices are made, but using the lens of an, econom of an economist to look at that world. And when we do, guess what we find? That, uh, well, looking specifically at, pol at climate politics and economics, it's looking at them with, uh, and taking away the romance, thinking about it as saying, okay, there are, there are no unicorns. Uh, there is no such thing as a revenue neutral tax, for example. There, uh, there is not a way to really efficiently regulate. Uh, and one reason for that is that there are people who have a stake in all of the rules that politicians make. I was amazed. I was mayor of a town of 6,500 people, and I was amazed at how many people would show up in city council meeting to promote their own agendas. To, well, I, mean, I, I can. I'll tell you one more story. I was. Uh, I'm. I'm a Mormon, and I spent uh, some years as a Mormon bishop, and it was kind of like a, a parish priest. And then I was a mayor. And people said, so what's it like being mayor? I said, it's kind of like being bishop, except that when you're a bishop, people are coming to you with their problems and trying to make things better. When you're mayor, people are coming to you with their problems, and they're just trying to screw their neighbors. <laughs> Politics allows that. And so if that's happening in a town of 6,500 people, think about what happens on, on a national stage or an international stage. So the players that we have are politicians who 
in most cases, are taking the actions they take, the stands they take, in order to get reelected. If you don't, I mean, and it's not that they're evil people, it's that they want to be elected so they can go do good things. And in order to get elected, <laughs> they, have to, they have to make choices we may not want them to be making. Second is voters. Voters will be, rel be relatively sympathetic to climate change, for example, but remain completely um, uninformed, but they, want, they think we should do something. And then there's interest groups who are going to seek rents, use the process to pursue their ideological commitments, many of which have nothing to do with climate. So if we look briefly at the uh, conference of parties, et cetera, et cetera, you notice that there are politicians and there are uh, interest groups in forms of companies. There are bureaucrats and NGO staff. What are these people getting out of these process, this process? Well, it very much like what Professor Yandel at uh, Clemson called a bootleggers and Baptist problem. The bootleggers, he, he grew up in the South. He tells the story so much better than I can, especially with his Southern accent. Uh, anytime that a town or county that is dry, when somebody is proposing to make it a, uh, to allow alcohol to be sold there, the Baptists come out in force against it they're funded by the bootleggers. <laughs> well, think about climate politics as being a bootleggers and Baptist problem. There are, uh, they go to really nice places. If you look at the companies that are saying this is a really big problem, we got to do something. We'll look at how they're going to benefit from act, from. Uh, the climate kinds of the kinds of climate bills that have been proposed, and um, the folks, the bureaucrats and the NGO staff, they get great vacations, and they really love to go do these things. Which leads me to, oops, I I could have done, I, I was a slide behind. <clears throat> he says I have three minutes. The problem with professors is we're used to speaking for 50 minutes, not 15 minutes. Uh, given that politicians are likely to screw things up, I mean, the first cap and trade bill was 50 pages and it didn't go anywhere. The one that passed the House was almost 1,500 pages because it had all of the carve outs for all of the various companies and, and special interest groups. It was a terrible, terrible bill even if we believe that cap and trade is a good system. A tax bill, uh, at, economists tend to prefer taxes as a way to change behavior over, over regulation, generally much more efficient, but as Fred Smith, who founded the Competitive Enterprise Institute said, um, having a sharper guillotine is not necessarily a good thing. And having a, a a policy that is wrong-headed or directed by an ide ideological perspective uh, or just based on uh, fear, just because you find an efficient way to, to Im impose that doesn't mean that it's necessarily a better thing. Um, and you know, the problem is that I pick up our local newspaper and there's almost always a letter to the editor saying, we have to do something. Politicians like to do something. Reporters like to talk to politicians who are do something guys. Uh, and saying, sit back, wait, we can adapt, we can mitigate. Humans are really good at slow move, dealing with slow moving disasters even if they generally don't turn out to be disasters, but we're good at adapting, at mitigating, at finding ways of, of solving problems just like the water problem I explained. There's so much entrepreneurial activity that could happen to deal with uh, climate change, supposing that it is happening, that I'm not worried about it. I think if we allow humans to be creative, we're going to get lots of great things happening just like on that, that stream that I, I described to you. Um, and the final thing, point I, 
wanted to make is that <clears throat> most humans are actually really bad at evaluating risk. <laughs> and we're easily scared. And that's a problem for any politician who's going to be promoting sane policy. Because people are scared. And <clears throat> so you're going to get all kinds of electoral pre pressures to promote solar and wind. So we subsidize them. Uh, to subsidize other supposedly green products like Solyndra or the Orange E. Hatch geothermal plant in southern Utah, which failed. Um, it's hard, it's really hard for a politician in that world to say, wait and see, we can figure this out. But that is the, that would be the best policy for all of us. So that's my take on how you use an economic lens to look at how politics works in the climate change world. Thank you.